And then uh, we also had, just had a financial discussion. We have a new treasurer, Anna Tang, who was elected, and we needed to change the bank account information uh, from Shannon Embry Bobo to Anna Tang at Wells Fargo. And with our election and installation of new officers, uh, the secretary that was uh, nominated and elected was me, Shannon Durham, and the treasurer, Anna Tang. She was nominated, seconded by nominated by BJ Week, seconded by Ryan Sarks. Uh, board of Directors Sean Cook is to continue as a board member, and then Connie DeSico was nominated by BJ Weeks, seconded by Ryan Sarks, and elected. Uh, the Board of Directors Ryan Sarks was nominated by BJ Weeks, seconded by Bernadette Pickering, and elected. And Board of Directors, uh, the Bernadette Pickering is to continue as a board member. There were two motions, a motion to reimburse BGA Weeks for the Zoom account on a monthly basis uh, as needed. And then offers, officers and directors, there was a motion to have the former officers and directors uh, removed. The board of director Bernadette Pickering brought a motion to eliminate uh, the officers and directors who did not attend that meeting and who have effectively abandoned their posts by not performing their duties. And Ryan Stark seconded the motion a motion was passed. And then we still have not, as far as items held over, uh, we have not selected a vice president. There's been no nomination or vote. And we also need two more board of directors. And that was it. The meeting was adjourned at 848 by Ryan Sarks. We're going to, to uh just hold off on the, the Zoom dollars for now. Uh, we'll okay. put it in the budget. We'll get a budget worked up and have it at the January meeting. Um, any corrections, additions to those minutes? I make a motion to approve the minutes. Motion made. Someone wave your hand if you're on mute. We'll count that as a second. Anna seconded. Yes. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Um, do we have new members? Would that be Anna or that is, have new members gotten to you, Shannon? Uh, I actually... Um not sure of who the new members might be. <laughs> I'm still okay. trying to go through the membership and figure out who was there the year before and who might be new. I believe that uh, this would be new since Charles the is a last new member meeting with us tonight. Um, and I haven't received any more. Um, We've lost you. Um, Ian, who is John, is his his uh, application was in the mailbox. Uh, Charles S. His application was in the mailbox. So officially, they're new members tonight. This is their first meeting. Brandon, have you been a member of the B Club, or are you visiting? What's your status? Just visiting, seeing what's going on. I say, are you are you a member of the B Club, or are you just visiting tonight? I'm just visiting tonight just to see what goes on. Okay, good, good, good. No pressure. <laughs> we welcome you. And uh, Bill, we welcome you visiting. Uh, this Zoom thing is not nearly as good as in person. Um, we've introduced the board. We welcome new members. Uh, Ryan, would you tell them a little bit about the moose and how that works? Sure. Um, I've uh, been friends of the administrator of the Moose Lodge for probably 25 years since I was a teenager. Um, and uh, anyway, they were kind enough to extend the opportunity for the B Club to hold meetings uh, in person uh, in their very large hall, uh, which has got tons of tables and chairs and so on and so forth. So last January, I believe, uh, the uh, club had voted to 
uh, we had to have two memberships. Um, they're $50 a piece to, to actually hold the meetings at the Moose Lodge. So we'd have members in the Moose Lodge. Um, and they voted to have BJ and myself to uh, be the members uh, and coordinate the meetings and stuff. Obviously with the COVID and everything that took place, we, we uh, only met there, I think, what, twice, maybe? Once. Once. February meeting, just the once. Wow. And uh, anyway, we had scheduled to have our summer picnic there and they were on board with it and then kind of everything blew up and then the governor uh, limited to 50 people and we usually have more than that at our, our summer picnic so it didn't pan out, uh, but the renewal for that uh, for the memberships if we do want to hold any meetings or any kind of events there coming up uh, will be for January so um, we would probably need to remo renew the uh, two memberships in order to have a, a free meeting place. Um, I will say the events there, we just basically have to pay, what was it, BJ? Do you remember to use the kitchen? I think it's like $100. $100. So it's very minimal, and that's the total cost for the whole year of meeting places. <laughs> so it's pretty cheap. We tell you this so that you can advise us how you would like us to proceed in planning the calendar for the year. Uh, I think it would be a good thing for us to go ahead and plan for June or July field trip picnic at the Moose and then the holiday dinner uh, annual meeting in November. Uh, and we would use the Moose Lodge for both of those as well as regular meetings. Those two things would not be on the Thursday night. They would both be on Saturday. So uh, what, is your, what is your wish? Do you want us to go ahead and make plans for in-person meetings after uh, summer gets here? Yes. And, Just to I clarify, heard. is it... Is it fifty dollars uh, for Ryan, fifty for BJ, and then another hundred for the kitchens for grand total of two hundred, or is it just a hundred dollars grand total, and that gives us the kitchen also? The, no, the, it is is fifty dollars for the each member, so it's made fifty for you know the first member, fifty for the second member, and then for each large event, not for our meetings. Our meetings are completely free, but for each large event that we hold there on the property. Uh, we usually have food and stuff, um, and they would want us to use to pay the rent on the kitchen facility. So that's an extra hundred dollars per large event. So it would be like for the July picnic and then again for maybe the holiday dinner in mm -hmm. next November. I think it sounds great. And I think by, um, I mean, hope, hopefully, they, by summer, you know, we'll, we will be able to meet you know, in person and have the gatherings and. I'm, I was losing sound there. But I was losing uh, sound also. I, I, I will uh, make a motion to have uh, the club uh, pay the two fifty dollars memberships and the hundred dollars for the kitchen for the two different events. Um, uh, that sounds like I think probably by then we'll have a handle on the virus and it won't be so terrible and we'll be able to ha have those two events. So go ahead and plan in-person meetings starting in the summer. Yes. Second. Second. All in favor? Uh, Wave your hand. I can see your aye. hands. <laughs> Anybody opposed? Okay, um, we will go ahead and work on a calendar for the January meeting. We'll try and have a calendar and the budget to present to the membership at that time. Uh, we will work on uh, trying to enlist a couple more directors and possibly a vice president at the January meeting. Uh, if anyone has uh, a topic that you think uh, is critical for us to use in our program this year, send me an email. Tell me the topic and tell me when you think it would be best to do it. If you need ideas and you want to look at the, the website, you can scan back about four years on the, the meetings that we've had, the speakers and the topics. 
Any questions on calendar and budget for next year? So PJ, will I get a invoice from the Moose Lodge or how will I know uh, how and when to pay for their, our membership? Right? I'm guessing they're gonna send us a renewal and will form. You send it'll me something probably, or? Yeah, it'll probably be like in January. Okay. And we'll just forward it to you at that time. Okay. We felt, Ryan and I felt like that would be better than us paying it and having you pay us. That way it's a direct link. Right, right. So they don't have our post office box address. They have your personal address. Uh, yes, because I think they have both, but because we are individual members of Moose, that's what allows us to use the facility. Okay. So we're not members as a club, we're members as individuals. I would like to introduce another person unless is there any more questions on calendar and, and budget for next year? Sophia. Hi. Unmute. There you go. Uh, right, Ryan, just, this is Sophia. I forwarded an email that she sent uh, this week. She wants to have us fill out a survey. And the question is, how do we want to deal with a survey? She is doing a, a high school honors research program, and she is a senior in high school over at Rome, Georgia, not Rome, Italy. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, the survey is just online. So if y'all want the link, you can fill it out online. And um, if anyone knows anyone that's like in a position of leadership, I think a lot of you probably are. I'm also doing interviews. so. Um, if anyone wants to not take the survey and do an interview with me over Zoom too, that would be awesome. Um, but yeah, so my research project is basically just about how beekeeping in North Georgia is and like what the main risk factors are because I know like the Varroa mite and a lot of other factors are big in most parts of the world, but I just want to see like specifically for the in the climate of Northwest Georgia. So yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we welcome you to be a visitor tonight and get to know us a little bit. Uh, Ryan, what's the best way for us to handle that? Do we want to just send that out to all the membership and let them either deal with it or not as they choose? I mean, we, yeah, I think that will be the best way if she just wants to deal with our actual members. Um, and, you know, we know that most of our members have been trained, you know, partially in the B Club and, and uh, have probably pretty good answers. So we can send it out via email uh, blast to all of our members. Um, you know, if, if uh, you, you want to send me something that you specifically want to send out, how you, however you want to word it, that if any of them are interested in doing additional interviews with you instead of answering that, that's fine. And uh, we can include that. Okay, I'll be happy to do an interview if, if, uh, if you would like me to. Okay, so I'll be perfect. Sometimes Ryan is overwhelmed with emails and such. He may not have read the email that you sent me and I forwarded to him this week. Right, Ryan? I don't think I had a chance to read the whole thing. There I we apologize. Go. Okay. I, I, I did remember seeing something come through, but I apologize. I, yeah. yeah, it's been a busy week. It, it gives a link fun. for the survey. And basically, I think what, what you said earlier was it would work out best for us to forward that out to the membership and let them respond directly to Sophia. Her deadline, as far as getting the data together, is the end of January. Yes. So the question is, do we want to send it out to last year's members and the current, or do we want to wait till the January meeting and just have a very short window to respond? I would go ahead and send it out now. Okay. And possibly send it out again the first week of January in case it gets lost in the holiday shuffle. We could. I'm pretty good about bugging people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Sophia, he, he has it, and he mm -hmm. has your – it's a fairly long explanation, and it, he'll put some good words yeah. with it and, and forward I that out to that. Yeah, I can shorten it for the rest of the people if you want. I just want to make sure y'all understood what was going on. But I can shorten the email if you want. Sophia, come. do you pronounce your name Sophia or am I calling you something strange? No, that's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, she comes across as a, a very smart student. Where are you going to go to college? Um, I'm not sure yet. I'm considering Samford 
University in Belmont, but I'm not sure yet. So you must be like a, a 5.3, way above the 4.0. <laughs> My school doesn't um, do it like that, but. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, but are yeah. you talking Stanford up in New England? Oh, no, no. Um, Samford, like with an M, it's in Birmingham. Okay. Uh, I, I was I was picturing that Ivy League school up there. No. It's still okay. a good college. Is well, we're real Belmont? proud of you doing a research project on the bees, and it, uh, it's a very frustrating thing. Uh, Sophia, is it Belmont in Nashville or Belmont in North Carolina? In Nashville. Okay. Good. Good for you. Thank you. Do you know that college, Connie? I do. I lived in Nashville. It's a great, Nashville's a great town and uh, Belmont's a good, great school. Yeah. Okay. So Sanford though. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's a hard choice. So just a curiosity, Sophia, is this a, uh, is this a senior project? Um, no, it's in place of a senior project. We have the AP capstone program at my school. And so basically you take one year of AP seminar where you do like research, like researching what other people have studied but then in AP research you have to create like new information for the body for the body of knowledge yeah so will we get a copy of your your final product um you probably I can send one to you <laughs> if you want we would like that we would like okay. that we, we would put it on our website and and uh, uh, have have anybody that wanted to look at it available for them to look at. And then you'll be published. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll ask my teacher to make sure that's like legal and everything, but yeah, I'm sure that would be fine. Thank you, thank you. Thank um, you. We briefly talked in the November meeting about uh, not doing B-School and instead tying in uh, B-School to the practical beekeeping class that uh, three of us teach. And I've gotten the okay to do it uh, with a few people in person at the Farm Bureau uh, Conference Center, conference room in Canton. And it is a large uh, conference table. We could easily have six, eight people around it. I want to have five or six in person because I know I will do a much better job uh, talking to people than I do talking to the computer. Some of you, it doesn't make any difference. You can do a good job either way. Um, what I have drawn up um, is, I believe it's like $35 a person if they have been a member in 2020 and kept bees. Uh, if anybody in the club wants to take the class and that they could do it virtually also. Um, new members, it would be 75 or if it is uh, in person, it would be for two people from the same household, there's a discount. Uh, but I'd like to go ahead and get an approval to pursue that and publish it from the club. Um, any of you that want to teach a session on it or, you know, take over something, that would be fine too, but it'd be good if you were a person that's already taken the class in the past. Uh, I personally you, think it's an exceptional idea to uh, give a, a deep discount to our existing members as a perk to the membership and I appreciate BJ even considering that. Uh, so I, I would make a motion to definitely move forward with that and offer it to our membership. Second. I would second that. Thank you. Any discussion? BJ, when we talked about that class, you said something about if somebody was doing the club, they could do the cat uh, class at 55? 35. 30, um, yeah. well, I mean, if you join the club, it's going to be 35 instead of if somebody just joins the club right now, it's, it'll be, it'll just be 35 for the club members. Or is that somebody that's already took the class? The, the 35 is someone that has been a member of the club the past year and has kept bees this year. 
Okay, what are you doing to close for next year in January? Uh, if you join right now, I, I, the way that I understand it, you would not be eligible for the discount. If you if you join for and were a member for 2020 and you also keep bees, that makes you eligible. Okay. We're going to work out something as far as a discount on the club membership or I'll pay, you know, half and they pay half or something if they want to be a club member. But yeah, I I don't have that in front of me right now and may, probably haven't even really looked at it good. Stephen, do you have any feedback on that? Talking, talking to me? Yeah. Do you have any feedback in regards to that, the pricing? No, I don't know. I was just trying to, to find out what it's going to be so I can let people know about the class. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll get it on the website this week, and I can, uh, I can forward something to you. Okay. Uh, Stephen is a person that I was on my way out the door to the first class last January, and it's a five Thursday night class and the hands on follow up. And uh, a guy calls me and it's an hour before the start of the class. So it's 530. Then I said, can you make it to the class in an hour? And he said, sure, no problem. <laughs> and so he and his wife came and were members of that class. And, and he he has been ex extremely grateful for the information he gathered in that class. Uh, Brandon was was in the class last year with number one son. Uh, number two son is wanting to take the class this year. Uh, the rest of you, uh, oh, Ian's been in the class, John. But uh, are you talking about the snowstorm and Jasper class? No, uh, that was the B Club's one day B school. Okay. The class we're talking about is um, a five week, one night, two and a half hour class, and then hands on. Uh, the goal of that class is to teach you to understand the bees better so that you can keep on learning as you look at the bees. And in doing that, uh, when you look at a frame in the beehive, you should be able to see a lot more detail and understand what's going on than, uh, for example, doing the one day B school. The one day B school, the whole goal of that class is to overwhelm you. And that's on purpose. It worked. Yeah. <laughs> but in saying that it's designed to overwhelm you, you have to get all the information wham bang to get you up to speed so that we can move on to more advanced things and not be dealing with beginning issues constantly. And that's what it's about. Brandon, you want to say anything about the class? I got a lot of information out of it and my son really enjoyed it and they both got very interested in it. Uh, I thought Cooper was too young for it. He's He's eight this year, but he's been more involved with me on the bees than really Austin has. So he's, he's asked me several times if he can take the class. So uh, hopefully we'll, we may be your in-class, in-person people. That'd be great. I need a few. I'm just terrified that everybody will want to do it virtual. So I, I, I'm grateful to have someone say they're going to plan to. Uh, that being said, um, we've had the motion from Ryan, which is basically to use this for the B school. Is that right, Ryan? I, I think that uh, it's definitely a, a good option since we probably won't be able to have our regular one day B school. Um, a a six-week B school is even better. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Any opposed? There weren't very many eyes, but there weren't any opposed, so I guess we're okay. Uh, well, let's go on to our uh, whole program for tonight. I know you're all here anxious to, to find out what to do to keep your bees uh, alive through the winter. What we need to do is have uh, about three people act as a panel. And these three people need to be people that have kept bees for at least three years. So you've gone through some winters. Uh, 
And then the rest of you will be people that if you want to type messages in on the, the chat line, you can. If, if we come to a point you want to ask, that's fine. And I'm going to ask these people to explain what they do getting ready for winter. And uh, looking at this, um, it looks like we're going to have uh, maybe John, Ian, if you take yours off mute, can we use you as a person on surviving the winter? Um, um, haven't done a good job. I didn't, I didn't take care of the bees that took care of the bees. So um, I didn't do a good job this year. Well, that's, that's okay. We, that's to explain what you did or didn't do is a good part of it. Tracy, would you consider unmuting your mic and... Let us converse with you. Uh, Stephen, you've kept bees for how many years? You don't hear me? Yes, sir. I've had them probably four or five years, but this is the first year with your help I've done better. And I'm getting so far to this point to the winter. Before, I hadn't had much luck. And Ryan will come in and out whenever he feels like he can, he needs to clarify something or uh, so let's, uh, I just lost all my pictures. I'm still here. Tracy's okay. still here. We still see you, BJ. Okay. I think Anna dropped off. Oh, I'm still here. Can you hear me? No, I see there you. There you are. Sorry. Everybody you shifted moved. right yeah, there. Yeah, moved. Sorry. Everybody moved. <laughs> um, well, Stephen... Why don't you tell us what you did different this year? And you've got, is it seven that you've got alive out of the nine that you had in the summer? Well, I started with seven and I've got eight right now. Okay. What I've got, I got up the highest 14, but I've got eight to go in the winter. The biggest what did thing you do different this year? Well, the biggest thing is you're helping with the mite treatment. I think it was the biggest thing and staying on top of the mites was my biggest thing to get up to this point to the winter. And, and this time I put the, the honey super on the bottom. I've got a full honey super on each hive on the bottom. And on top I've got where I'm feeding a jar of sugar water and a jar of honey on top with three holes in them. Raised up about, I'd say I got a, about a half inch spacer is what I've got. So they're not touching the frame. You're talking the brood frames. On the brood frame, right. Okay. Then do you feel like you got good control of the mites in late summer? Uh, the second treatment I've got in the fall, I think I got good head up with it. Because I did uh, just a sticky board under the bottom and a couple of them was still high. <laughs> Most of them was real low on that. Okay. Uh, Tracy. Yes. How, how are you doing as far as survival? Uh, it's been a rough winter for me. Um, I did not get control of the mites. Uh, the mites have had control of me. Um, seems like a couple of years ago, doing the treatment in the fall seemed to be enough, but uh, doesn't seem to be enough for mine this year. Um, so I've, I've had some pretty good losses. Are you going to change anything next year? Yes. Um, the one thing that I want to start off with, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to add a um, apivar strip in January. And I'm hoping that that will keep the surviving bees, knock the mites down uh, before spring even begins. And I am contemplating, I got a, um, I, I want to treat two or three times during the year. I'm, I'm aiming for three times. Okay. Um, Ian, do you want to tell us anything? Can you, can you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, to me, it, it, feeding is a big deal in, in um, uh, August, 
uh, well, let's just say July, August, and September. Um, when, when I fed them uh, last year, um, I, I did fine. I, I, sw I survived all, all the way up until about, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And I, I, I absolutely ignored my bees. And, you know, of course, when you ignore them, they die. So uh, I think feeding's a big deal in, in those uh, months that the nectar isn't flowing. Yes. And that's the, that, that's the end of my comment. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, any questions for these these people? Well, when you talk about feeding, exactly what are you feeding? Do you want me to be a smart aleck or do you want me to give you a good answer? We're feeding, <laughs> we're feeding the bees. <laughs> Yeah, what um, is the food product? Or sugar syrup? Is that what you feed in? Yeah, uh, yeah, yes, uh, yes, I do. Uh, you know, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, half and half. You know, five five pounds of sugar and five pounds of water. And when did you did you change it to a heavier mixture when we got into October? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I just okay. made sure I, I just kept feeding them and, you know, they kept taking it and I kept feeding them. Yeah. The, one of the strategies is to medicate <laughs> as close to the 1st of August as you can, uh, be feeding them at that time. So you have a high activity level and good brood volume, and that makes the medication more effective. And by treating the 1st of August, you've got a month to get control of the mites. And when the golden rod generates high brood volume, you wear out all of the bees that were affected by the viruses and mites and generate a whole new population of healthy bees to go through the winter. And that's been our strategy for many years. And over the last, I don't know, five or 10 years, the idea of doing something in October just to keep uh, a resurgence of the mites and to just get them a little bit cleaner for the winter has been uh, a good thing. But if you vary from that schedule and end up having mites longer in the summer or treating later into the fall, uh, when you get a cold front like we have had the last couple of weeks uh, and then it warms up, a lot of the bees don't come back to the hive. And that's an issue. Um, as far as the, the feeding, our, our normal has been to change to two to one when we get into October. Uh, in fact, diminish the feeding in September in case the goldenrod comes on with a strong nectar flow. And if you're feeding wide open in September with a nectar flow, it could cause swarming in your hives could definitely cause problems. And even if it doesn't cause swarming, it could cause the brood volume to diminish to the point that they're just totally damped with liquid food. So uh, we're gonna cover a little bit more on that in a little bit, but let's, uh, let's see if you have any questions in regard to getting ready for winter or something that someone has done that is different that you want to comment on or share? I have a question. Yes. I have uh, one out of two of my colonies survived thus far. And I actually went and visited them today. And there I have two um, Langstroth uh, two deep boxes, and I had eight frames of bees. I mean, they're just there's just so many of them in there, and I'm worried they're going to run out of food uh, sometime over the winter. So I just I'm not sure what to do if you have a really high population at this point in time. Okay, you're basically asking uh, how to evaluate and and understand what their state is and what they're going to need for the next what six weeks mm -hmm. yes okay anybody want to answer that okay this is my first winter by the way 
I've never overwintered bees. Tracy, if you had hives with eight frames of bees, what food volume and where would you want that food to be? Well, the, the first thing I would say is you need to take a warm day like today was in Forsyth and inspect your bees and see about how much food you have. Um, you definitely want a food frame on either side of the brood cluster. And um, at this time of year, if you moved your supers to the bottom, uh, there's a good place for a, a jar of sugar water on top um, to uh, make sure that they're getting uh, food directly so that the food doesn't get too far away from them if we get a cold snap. Thank you. What would you look for in the hive, Tracy, to know if the bees were uh, in trouble as far as food? A, a bad sign for me would be is um, when I'm when I'm looking at the uh, the cluster when I'm looking at the frames that have brood when I look at them and don't see food around the brood that's a problem or if I see a full frame of brood or excuse me a full frame of food and then an empty frame between that frame and the brood. Uh, that's that's not a good sign. It shows that they're eating what they can get to, but um, if you get a cold snap, they need something as close to them as possible. So uh, if if you don't see food around the brood, that's a bad sign. Or if you see an empty frame on either side of your brood, I think that's a bad sign that they need more food. Were you in bees today? Yes. Did you see any uh, dead brood, you know, just cells of pupa that were open and, and they didn't get out of their cell? I didn't see any of that. Okay. The bottom of the cluster starves first. And if they don't have the food wrapped around it, even if it's coming down the sides of the cluster, uh, there's they just can't relocate food on cold nights. And so that's where you're gonna have starvation take place. Uh, Stephen, have you been in your bees this week? No, I hadn't been in it this week. You feeding them this week? Yeah, I've got feed on them right now, yes. Okay. And you're feeding with jar or a feeder? Jar. Okay. Got a jar of sugar water, two to one mix, and a jar of honey. Okay. If you were in a hive today and it had absolutely zero food, how would you try to get them up to speed with some stored food and keep on feeding them. I, mean, I didn't catch that. Um, if you were in a hive today and let's say it had eight frames of bees, but there was just almost zero food, what would you do different for that hive than you did for the others? Huh. We can let Ryan answer that one. Charger in case. Can you can you repeat the question for clarification? If you were in a hive today and you know normal would be a, a good bit of food in hives, but you had one hive that had eight frames of bees and near zero food, how would you deal with that hive differently than you did the previous? Um, well, I mean, with, with a good population, uh, they should be able to move some food on a, a warm day. Um, you could definitely, if you had a extra super on another hive that had food, you could put it up underneath that brood chamber they will be able to move some of that food up into the brood chamber and they're gonna collect it and see it quicker because they're moving through that uh, if the, if the uh, super's on the bottom of the hive. Um, you know, I have had situations like that and <laughs> I've taken some of the outer frames out, a um, couple of the out, outer frame, and I've poured two to one syrup in the cells uh, just to get food in there by the cluster. It's a, I called it an emergency feeding, but actually I just poured the syrup right into the cells because they kind of sit at an angle anyway. So when you put them back in, it holds that fluid. 
you can also uh, take some, uh, you know, and, and put a jar on top, uh, top frame feeder um, and let it drip down onto the cluster, especially if it would, was going to get cold that night. You would probably consider switching a couple of frames of honey from other hives into that one to put it outside the cluster edges, kind of wall them in with honey. If I had honey to spare, yes. In other hives, yes. That's one of the advantages of having some double brood chamber hives. They've either got, in the summertime, they've got extra brood, and in the wintertime, you can usually count on having extra brood frames of honey. Uh, going through my hives today, there were hives that there were no bees in, but they still had a super of honey and honey in the brood frames. And so I was uh, adding those frames to the supers and moving supers to the bottom underneath the cluster. When we say that, usually we're putting the excluder under the brood chamber. Uh, but as it was pointed out, that allows us to put a jar on and have that jar immediately on top of the brood frames with just a little quarter, half inch gap so the bees can access those uh, holes in the lid. Uh, feeding right now, you're feeding to keep a little bit in their stomach so that they have a higher activity level and they can relocate and use the food that they have stored. If you're pouring, trying to pour large volumes to them, um, that's not really the best thing for the bees. Anybody have a question on that statement? When you say pour large volumes to them, are you talking about a interfeeder that might get cold? Is that what you're talking about? Or six jars on top of the okay. brew chamber. Yeah. You, you want them to use the, their resources that they have. And if you can keep some food in their stomach, they won't be starving at the bottom of the cluster. If they don't have any food in their stomachs by morning, they're, they're basically on borderline starvation. And uh, for example, today, I waited till about 10.30 to start opening hives. And it was warm enough to work in a t-shirt at that point, but it was still cold inside the hives. The bees were still on the sluggish side. And so, uh, what temperature you can work at in the bees changes from month to month. In February, if the sun's shining and the hive's in the sun, I will start working in bees at 45 degrees because they can get back into the hive at that point, uh, you know, eight o'clock in the morning. I just pick the hive that I do that with because if you've got a hive that's a little bit on the aggressive side, they're gonna be worse uh, when it's cold and you're, you're disturbing them. Anytime the bee's stomach is not full, they're going to be more reactive, which means they're going to fly out and buzz you and be a little upset at you bothering them. And so your, your hives that have the nature of being more aggressive, you want to leave those till it warms up good and do the nice, calm, gentle ones first. Surely someone's got a question. BJ, I just want to clarify. It's me. Uh, so do we need to worry about breaking? I mean, is, is it totally OK to to, you know, move the boxes around like put a were we talking about putting the uh, honey super on bottom? We don't need to worry about the propolis that they have built up to kind of insulate and all the cracks and stuff. I like guess that's totally OK. And then my um, uh, okay, so let's do, let's answer answer that one. Is it okay? I mean, on if it's a warm sunny day, we don't have to worry about breaking the propolis and um, the value of moving it to the bottom. You're surrounding them with food, and uh, it's it's worth doing that. Right right now, if you're if you're dealing with the cluster. The question you have to ask is if, if bees get dropped on the ground, will they make it back into the hive? Mm -hmm. 
And if the answer is no, you want to make sure that you're very, very careful. You move one frame out from the edge of the hive and then just move frames out looking at them and always keeping the frame right over the hive. Mm -hmm. So the bees dropping will go back in. Uh, if you're in there and it's 32 degrees and some bees fly out, very doubtful that most of them would make it back into the hive. But putting that super early in the morning when they've been in a tight cluster in the brood area, even if they don't have brood, there's going to be very, very few bees in the super, even with honey. Mm -hmm. And moving it to the bottom not only surrounds the cluster with food, but it gives you the ability to put a jar on top that will be right next to the brood frames. Mm -hmm. Is there any value in sprinkling dry sugar on top of the frames? As far as like a, a just another food source for them? That's kind of a northern thing. Um, you know, if a guy had 50 hives and, and he couldn't drive to them and he had to hike a quarter mile uh, to get to the bees and... Uh, you know, snow and ice and mud problems. Uh, pouring that sugar in there on the inner cover so that the bees will come up and get it, that's a good option. And the same with fondant. But here in Georgia, uh, they do fine with syrup. They do not do fine with frame feeders once they are minimal brood and the temperature is below freezing or at freezing. Uh, some of you I know are, are aware of the temperature that a bee goes into a coma. Anybody remember? This will help you to understand the, the nature of feeding and, and uh, the bee going down into a feeder in the wintertime. 47 degrees. If a bee goes down into a frame feeder and sucks up its body weight, of 28 degree syrup, it is not going to make it out of the frame feeder. You're going to have dead bees in the frame feeder. High activity level, high, high population, these things make the frame feeders less damaging to the bees. Uh, this is a, a phenomenon that only occurs after the middle of November when it starts getting cold and your brood volume is diminished. Mm -hmm. Um, well, if there aren't any questions, I've got a uh, document I'm going to pull up and share with you. And Anna, while he's doing that, I was just going to throw in there, definitely the value of breaking that seal loose is greater to go ahead and feed your bees if they're hungry. Um, they'll, they'll actually, on a warm day, they'll have that sealed back up in 24 hours. So they're, uh, they, they, I call it my bee caulking. They'll caulk it right back up. But if it's warm, it's totally okay to take out every frame and do a quick look. I, I have actually gone through frame by frame at 55 degrees, so. Okay. A lot of times you don't need to do that every time. And you can do a, a quick inspection this time when you're trying to make sure you've got the time to get them all done. And what about, sorry, what about probiotics? Is, do y'all sprinkle probiotics on, sorry, she's barking. Do you sprinkle probiotics on in the winter time or is that more of a spring, summer, early fall kind of thing? First, uh, I'll answer that. I, I, I use uh, probiotics year round. If I'm in the hive, uh, about every two to three weeks, I'll, uh, you know, I'll sprinkle some, uh, no longer than a month, I'll sprinkle probiotics in there. Um, and I've noticed a significant difference in the health of my honeybees by doing that. So, and I will say the recent research by the company that actually makes, um, oh shoot, I can't remember the brand, but 
anyway, they have put out that they actually recommend putting probiotics in them every two weeks now. Is that the Pro DFM that Man Lake sells? You got it. That's the name. Okay. Do you guys have my uh, my sheet, my Word document up on your screens now? No. Do I need to hit screen share or something like that? <laughs> yes, you do. Okay. And just pick Word, you'll screen share and then probably Word or share your screen. Well, I hit share screen. It should give you some options. It'll pop up a, a thing and then you just click on if it's Word, you hit Microsoft Word or the okay. name of your file. Oh, okay. There we are. Now you've got it. So these are the primary causes of bees dying September through January. It's very, very simple. Uh, varroa mites, if you didn't treat, or even if you did treat and did not get good control of your mites, or if their population rebounded. Uh, tied into that also would be if you did not get a good goldenrod uh, stimulation to produce new brood and wear out the old bees and hatch new healthy bees for the winter. Queen issues. Uh, very rarely does a queen that your hive raises last through the winter. I had two hives today that had no queen. I, I saw a dead queen that had hatched this week on the, the screen underneath the brood chamber. Uh, what happens is if they don't get enough quantity in mating, their pheromones are not adequate or the bees can, can know that they don't have enough matings to be durable. And so they say, well, we're gonna replace her before she wears out. And of course, replacing her in December is uh, even worse than having a queen that's not well mated. Uh, starvation. Um, when you have the bees lose, say, 20% of their population, they're going to stay centered on a little patch of brood in the middle. And what happens is they're an inch away from food all the way around the cluster. And so by morning, they're in starvation. They don't have the energy to break out of that cluster. And by the time you know, two o'clock comes in the afternoon, it's, it's getting warm in the hive, and now they can break out of the cluster, but by three o'clock, the temperature's going back down again. And that's, that's the situation of this week. Um, so that's starvation when they have 40 pounds of food in the hive. And so if you look at a hive and you want to know what caused them to die, you have to eliminate the symptoms to be able to identify the problem. What, what initiated the problem? Uh, you can see dead bees or bees with their heads in the cells and, and bees that didn't get out of the pupa stage. And uh, you would say, well, you know, this is the problem. Well, starvation really wasn't the problem there. That was the symptom that tied into their final demise. But the real problem was viruses or mites that they didn't generate enough new bees to have healthy bees go through the winter. The question you have to ask yourself is, could uh, the end result have been altered by management? What could I have done sooner to take good care of the situation and not have it happen. So this is emergency feeding and intensive care. Everybody knows the term intensive care. Uh, it's interesting, a lot of people promote nukes. And when a person buys nukes and doesn't understand packages, 
they never learn intensive care. But intensive care and emergency feeding would be at a time where you don't normally feed and you don't normally need to feed to be able to uh, keep some food in their stomachs so that you don't keep on losing bees from that hive. Immediately above the cluster, uh, slow feed. So the, if you've got a jar on there and they've got plenty of food stored around the cluster, you're not wanting that jar to empty in 24 hours. You might want it to empty over a week's time. If it's a small cluster, a pint jar, you might want it to empty over 10 days time, maybe even two weeks, just to keep some in their stomachs. Pollen substitute. The cluster dynamic has changed. They're no longer having a frame of pollen on each edge of the cluster. So to give them some pollen substitute will allow the brood that they have to finish out its cycle. And it will encourage them to keep that cycle going. Um, with brood, your, your, pop, your temperature of the cluster is higher. So the bees are a little bit more active. It doesn't jump from 75 to 95 overnight, but it gradually, as they get more and more brood, and more bees, they uh, bring that temperature up to 95 degrees as opposed to the 75 with brood dust. Um, moving the super underneath the brood chamber. Several of you do that and you've mentioned it tonight. One of the keys on that is to return that empty super to the top before the swarm season starts. So usually by the end of February in Cherokee County, you're wanting to, your super on the bottom should be empty. It works the same way if you have two brood chambers. We talked about the two brood chambers a little bit earlier. Uh, right now, I would want um, the cluster and any brood to be in the top. And if there's excess uh, honey stored in the hive, have it underneath the cluster in that bottom brood chamber. The idea being that in Cherokee County, by the end of February, you could have eight frames of brood in the top and a half a super of bees above the brood chamber. And then when you reverse that uh, bottom brood chamber up to the top, that is underneath the excluder, uh, they will move right into it quickly. You should probably have brood in it in a couple of days. And that puts you on a cycle to be ready to make a split a month later. Uh, Monroe County down here for Bill, uh, end of January, you know, if you do a good job getting your bees through the winter and you've got uh, eight frames of brood in the top brood chamber, they're ready to reverse the end of January. That's a real good schedule to have. Adding bees. Uh, anybody ever add bees to a hive? I know Wes has, and uh, Stephen helped Wes to get some more bees in some of his. Why would you want to add bees to a hive? A couple of reasons. One, a, a queen loses uh, the semen that she's storing in her spermatheca, often loses viability if the temperature of that queen gets down in the area of 37 degrees. So if you have just a small cluster and they can't keep the queen warm, um, she may end up going infertile. Uh, you lose activity level. If you have a small cluster, uh, you just keep on losing a few more and a few more and a few more until you don't have enough to function at all. So how do you add bees to a hive? Um, my rule of thumb has always been, if you're adding 50% to the existing population, cage the queen for a day. I didn't have any queen candy with me today, so I put a couple of queens in and put pollen patty, pollen substitute in the tube for the, so they could eat her out and she'll be out in a day just by the bees letting her out. Uh, adding the bees above the excluder so they have to work their way down through the frames and get in with the, the hive. Uh, 
is a good way to do that also. Anybody have any comments on this little wrap up at the end? Questions? Tracy, are you raising your hand or are you just stretching? No, I'm moving my glasses. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just caught the motion. Well, um, anybody want to make a comment that I have a this question. has helped you or it's a waste of your time? I have Shannon a quick question. has a question, BJ. Okay. I, I, I'm, you keep mentioning the excluder. I didn't know I was supposed to have an excluder on the hive right now. So well, can you explain that a little bit so I understand why and where and please? Most people in Georgia do not run double brood chamber hives the year round. You go to Michigan and they might have three brood chambers going into winter. And so there's no reason to keep a super on the hive. But if you have a hive with one brood chamber, you're going to need some food in a super to supplement what they have stored in the brood chamber, especially if it's a real strong hive. Your situation with two brood chambers uh, you know, we talk about a super, we're talking about two boxes on the hive usually. And your two boxes are both brood chambers. So it just, you know, it just, you adapt. It's, it's personal preference. I usually tell people, it, it, my, my little joke is I, I don't normally like eggs in my honey. I usually wait and put that on my biscuit. <laughs> Ryan's a smart Alec. <laughs> no, I leave my my excluders on, but I'm only running one brood chamber, and the rest are super. So it just keeps the the queen from moving up, um, you know. But I will say, you know, if the bees are starving and all the food, and they they haven't moved food down into the brood chamber. If they only have food in the super, they could potentially, uh, I've seen it to where the cluster moves up and leaves the queen behind and she can't get to them. Uh, so she, she's died. Absolutely. Sometimes she even squeezes through the excluder, doesn't she? Yeah, definitely when she's not laying much, she can. Okay, well, unless there's any more questions, we're gonna shut it down for the night. Uh, we'll be back in January and your board will meet and work on calendar and, and Ryan and Anna are going to uh, try to build us a budget for next year. Hey Jay, I had one more thing to say yes. or question and I, I'm sorry I, I was, should have squeezed this in at the beginning. Uh, the checks that that I collected from the post office box last week uh, have we decided how we want to handle those checks? If we want to return them to the applicants uh, with an apology for the fact that they sat unattended for so many months and um, potentially caused some confusion as to, you know, where is this check that I wrote? Um, and, and do we want to extend to them like a complimentary membership for 2021 or how how does everyone want to handle that? Any comments? Yes, I think that that is a, a good idea. Uh, considering many of them didn't get the email, the emails they should have gotten as members. So they kind of missed out on the benefits of their 2020 membership. I was one of those people, right? You were. Yes. Okay, I do not want my check back. <laughs> <laughs> if now yeah, you're here now, but if if you were a person that sent it in and we're not at this meeting tonight, would you be appreciative of a letter asking if it's okay to deposit your check, an email? 
there should be some kind of communication to acknowledge it and a, an option. So would you still like to be a member? Can we, you know, well, a free membership or half off or something like that. You know, like, I don't know if it has to be all the way. I don't want to make it really difficult, whatever I go along, but you know, yeah. What about if you take that check and just apply it for next year for 2021 since they wasn't a member in really 2020? See if they want to go ahead and deposit a check and use it for next year. Would you like to make that a motion? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion. Just contact the, the person that wrote the check and see if they want to be a member for 2021 and use that check for 2021. If they don't, then just give it back to them. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Shannon has a letter written and she would just have to add another phrase to it to say exactly what, what you have in your motion. Um, my understanding is that sometimes the bank won't take the check if it is uh, more than six months old. Trina is sitting out in the bee yard, but the sun's still up, Trina. <laughs> it's been a busy day. Still going on. <laughs> you don't even know where that bee yard is. I'm sure you told me. Looks like cotton fields to me. Yeah, Tr Trina's doing Ryan's thing, putting the picture back behind her. <laughs> that was a, a photo I took while I was had everything set up, ready to load those bees and move them. And I was, uh, you know, I, I labeled it moving time at the bee yard. Okay, any discussion on that motion? All in favor? Raise your hand, uh, wave a hand. All right. Some of you people are frozen on, there it is, okay. Uh, Shannon, it's up to you. And uh, we're just going to be real easy. You know, if they want to, if they want to pay another membership for 2021, we won't argue with them. But I'll go ahead and offer them to have that membership applied to 2021. Okay, and, I'll set uh, that out this week. I, I Shannon wanted, is very good at writing letters. BJ, I did want to note, uh, Trina mentioned it earlier uh, when the meeting first started, but uh, that she was going through some boxes, but I was able to get in touch with um, our past secretary treasurer and uh, she returned seven totes today um, on my porch and Trina came and picked them up and uh, the checks were in there. So um, uh, she does have uh, a couple other totes she set in a storage, uh, and then she will bring those in the next few days. So we were able to recover some of the equipment. And we did not waste any time changing uh, the signature at the bank. Uh, the day after our meeting in November, uh, Shannon Embry Bobo's name was no longer valid at the bank and the uh, debit card was canceled. If there's no further comments, questions, important things to announce, we will take a motion to close the meeting. I will make a motion to close the meeting at 825. Okay, and Anna will take yours as a second. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. I'm waiting to see if Trina is going to stay online. Nope, she went off. Did you see who I, made it down there in the bottom? He's asleep, though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can you hear us, Dan? His eyes are closed. Hey, turn hey, turn the recording off, BJ. Okay. Stop recording. <laughs>